Well, thank you, uh, all of you, for joining us, and welcome to this McKinsey Global Institute Economics Insights webinar on the future of work after COVID-19. For those of you who don't know MGI, we are the business and economics research arm of McKinsey, and we were founded 30 years ago in 1990. A week ago, we published a report on the future of work after COVID-19, which builds on a decade of research on labor markets. And it's part of a series of reports that MGI will be publishing on the post-pandemic economy in the next few weeks. We have an action-packed hour ahead of us. It will consist of, first of all, a brief presentation of the report findings themselves, and followed by a panel discussion, and then finally a question and answer session. Three of the authors of the report are with us on this webinar today. They are MGI partners Susan Lund, based in Washington, and Anu Madgavkar in Mumbai, and Mary Meany, who's a senior partner and the leader in McKinsey's organizational practice out of Paris. And we're pleased to have us for this panel discussion a, a little later, Sir Chris Pissarides, Nobel laureate at, at the LSE, and an MGI academic advisor on the report, and Stefan Ries, the former CHRO of SAP. Uh, just a quick housekeeping, you are encouraged to ask questions, and you can do so through the chat. Um, and what you do is you essentially type your question into the Q&A panel, which is located in the lower right, on the lower right-hand side of your screen. You select all panelists from the Ask drop-down menu and type your question and click the Send button. Anyway, without further ado, let me hand over to Anu for the presentation of our report. Thank you, Peter, and thank you to everyone who's joined uh, us in this webinar today. We're delighted to introduce this report to you. This is actually um, the first in a series of three reports from MGI that will talk about uh, the long-term structural effects of COVID-19. Uh, and we did, in fact, look at the long-term uh, after sort of studying and analyzing how work has been massively disrupted by COVID over the last 12 months. We focused our uh, research on eight countries uh, and looked at uh, trying to estimate labor demand, the mix of uh, jobs in demand, uh, and the kinds of skills that will be in demand out to 2030. Uh, what we found from this research is that uh, the sheer magnitude and the scale and challenge of occupation transitions is likely to grow uh, to a significant extent. Across the eight countries, we estimate something like 100 million workers will need to make transitions to new occupations if they are to stay employed by 2030. And this is about 25% more than what we would have expected and estimated prior to the pandemic. Uh, not all of these effects will be evenly distributed. So some groups of workers and some particular groups of occupations, in particular the ones that have very high physical proximity to other people, uh, will be affected much more. Uh, and this is a sort of playing out of trends that COVID-19 has accelerated uh, and, uh, you know, have their most disruptive effects on certain parts of the workforce. So let's just start with that concept, which is basically a, a new contribution from this research around the notion that all occupations aren't the same in terms of physical proximity. Uh, we looked at 800 occupations and scored them based on five metrics of um, uh, you know, how, how close or what types of human interactions these uh, workers in these occupations typically face. Uh, do they work close to other human beings? What's the frequency of these interactions? Are they meeting new sets of people all the time? Or is it the same set of people that they know that they meet? Do they work indoors? And do they need to be in a particular location in order to do their work or not? And we found that based on these scores, we were actually able to cluster uh, these occupations into 10 uh, occupational clusters that we call work arenas. Uh, and these differ uh, quite a bit, both in terms of those proximity measures, as well as uh, simply the venues and places where people cluster to work. Uh, and they also differ in terms of the disruption that uh, is implied by uh, COVID's long-term effects. So four work arenas will actually face the uh, largest disruptions. Uh, On-site customer interaction, uh, typically sales and service-oriented roles in retail stores, banks, and so on. Uh, leisure and travel roles, which are, again, customer-facing. They could be in 
restaurants, recreation centers, or uh, travel hubs like airports. Uh, indoor production and warehousing. Indoor production could be of various kinds. It could be factory related work, but it could also be working in an industrial uh, kitchen, for instance, or even a lab. Uh, and then warehouses and logistic centers. And then finally, computer based office work, which is again a reasonably dense uh, agglomeration of workers uh, that, that work typically in an indoor environment. Uh, and uh, while all of these work arenas do face some kinds of disruptions. It's really concentrated in these four because the trends that COVID-19 has accelerated uh, are playing out sort of most, uh, most actively across these. Uh, we looked at three groups of trends. Uh, the first is really around remote work and its knock-on effects on travel. Uh, work from home surged uh, during the pandemic, uh, but we looked at it in, in terms of roughly 2,000 different occupations uh, that each of our uh, 2,000 different activities that each of our occupations uh, uh, engage in. And we found that some activities can actually be done remotely with very little or, or no loss of productivity and effectiveness. Uh, and if you look at it that way and build it up, we found that 20 to 25 percent of the workforce in most advanced economies could actually work remotely three to five days a week without losing much uh, effectiveness or productivity. And that's a, a large number. If the adoption of remote work persists in line with that potential, it would mean it would be lower than the peaks that we saw during the pandemic, but it would still be four to five times higher than the levels that we typically saw earlier. And this will have very significant knock-on effects uh, on business travel, for instance, which is easily substituted by virtual meetings. Uh, and our estimates would suggest uh, business travel could end up 20% lower in 2030 than what the baseline or normal expectation would be, whereas leisure travel would be far less affected. And this would also have implications for urban density, urban centers, and shifts from larger to smaller cities and suburbs, for example. Uh, the second group of trends is really around e-commerce and a range of virtual and digital transactions and interactions. Uh, across countries, we saw the share of e-commerce sales rising from anything uh, between two times to five times what the trend would have been uh, had we not actually seen the pandemic. Uh, and this we see is, is a force or a trend that's likely to persist uh, simply because this has revealed uh, much greater uh, customer convenience. And surveys, we do suggest that between 50 and 80% of consumers are actually keen to maintain these levels of e-commerce usage. And in addition, in new categories, which are delivery based, including restaurant delivery, food delivery, grocery delivery, and so on. Some of this may go back to uh, in-person uh, experiences, but to a great extent, uh, these trends will persist. Uh, and then finally, the trend around automation. Increased automation was seen across a variety of work arenas largely to manage some of the shocks uh, to, to, uh, uh, to health, uh, safety concerns, you know, spikes and variability in demand during COVID-19. And this was essentially seen in things like industrial robots being used in factories to stabilize production and de-densify uh, the shop floor. It was also seen in terms of things like app-based ordering for food uh, and self-checkout at retail uh, centers. Uh, but but looking looking back at multiple different crisis periods across countries, we also found that automation tends to accelerate in the 18 to 24 months uh, as economies come out of a crisis or a recession. Uh, and if this happens, uh, you know, in, in the current context as well, this is a trend that actually would would continue to accelerate even beyond what we've seen. So what does this all mean for demand in the workforce? Um, this is an example of the US, but uh, very similar patterns uh, you know, were found across different countries. We modeled a set of long-term trends that, that are structural in nature, but also overlaid on that uh, these effects of COVID-19 in terms of you know, uh, the impact of remote work, e-commerce and digital interactions and automation. We found that there were a set of occupations where uh, demand in 2030 would be higher than what we would have expected. And these include occupations in the health professions, uh, technology-based occupations, 
as well as actually transportation services, simply because of the rise of the delivery economy and you know goods moving to people instead of people actually moving uh, to to centers where they shop. But on the other hand, we saw large declines uh, in in potential labor demand in a set of occupations as well on the right hand side here, and these were customer service and sales, food services. Uh, office support, which is uh, largely computer based work, and these are all prone to uh, significantly higher uh, automation as, and uh, the use of digital transactions as well. Um, overall, these numbers do add up to a significantly larger number of these occupation transitions, by which we mean that more people are going to need to switch occupations in order to stay employed because their current occupations are declining or will decline by 2030. Uh, in the US, for example, we would expect about 17 million workers to actually make occupation transitions or need to make them by 2030. And this is 28% um, higher than what we would have expected earlier. So the numbers vary uh, across countries. It's, it's lower in some of the emerging economies uh, that we looked at as well. But overall, this is a very significant number with about 100 million or more workers who need to switch occupations. Uh, and, and the challenges of um, reskilling and redeploying workers will be more, uh, particularly for groups that already uh, face structural disadvantages or are vulnerable. So we would expect the increase in occupation transitions to be four times higher, for instance, for women, uh, almost five times higher for workers without a college degree, and also significantly higher for young workers uh, and workers uh, of, uh, with, uh, who are racial minorities, uh, which, which implies that workers who already have been uh, you know, struggling to uh, have the right skills and, and advance in their work would actually be find it even harder going forward. Um, on the bright side, there is there are a set of career pathway transitions that that could materialize, and uh, enabling them to materialize is a big part of the solution. Uh, just by way of illustration, here uh, we looked at you know the role of the cashier, and we said there were two potential career pathways for a cashier to move. One would be within the healthcare stream of occupations, um, uh, and a, a worker could potentially, through a series of uh, upskillings, move towards being some kind of uh, nursing assistant or finally uh, a radiology technician, for example, uh, at three to four times uh, the pay. Uh, an alternative pathway might, for example, be in sales and management, a similar set of role transitions that could lead to uh, the occupation of a sales manager with six times the pay. So these are possible, but they do involve some significant reskilling efforts at key points on this career ladder. So businesses and policymakers both have um, uh, a lot to do to actually make this brighter side of the future of work materialize. Um, in terms of businesses, we think that uh, as, as we come out of the pandemic, this is not the time to go back to working exactly the way we used to work earlier, but a real opportunity to reimagine work, starting with just the physical dimensions. Where do we work? Uh, it's going to be important for businesses to think about what their own version of a more distributed and hybrid remote model will be. And employees will expect this. It's, it's a big part of the employee value proposition, and this is one one big reason why companies are going to think about this. Uh, the use of technology to stay agile uh, is an important part of the how we work. But coming to the skills we need, I think uh, you know a lot of attention is going to need to be paid here to, first of all, trying to understand uh, how to even assess workers for the categories of skills which will grow in demand, which will include socio-emotional skills and technological skills. Uh, and also then how to think about uh, models of reskilling that uh, that are very time effective uh, and fit for purpose and very targeted and specified in that sense. There's also a big cultural shift that that uh, companies are going to need to think about. Uh, adaptability and the culture of lifelong learning is something that organizations are going to need to inculcate top to bottom, and individuals are going to need to also adopt and embrace that mindset simply because of the pace of change in terms of what's expected. Uh, and then given that diversity and inclusion have actually 
uh, taken a beating in terms of the effects of COVID, uh, part of the culture shift will be to double down and you know, re-embrace with new vigor the whole agenda around diversity. Finally, uh, in terms of uh, what policymakers uh, could consider, uh, clearly there's a big agenda here. Uh, if we were to pick one uh, critical element of it, it's to expand digital infrastructure and really ease the access, make, make it more affordable, make it more accessible, just given uh, that access to work will be largely dependent on this. But in addition, a range of things that policymakers could consider to essentially lower barriers to physical mobility, occupational transitions, uh, and to relearning uh, and, and lifelong learning. So to reduce barriers at every step to ease the transitions. And to think about this in a very partnership and collaboration oriented way. Uh, I'm going to stop here because we have a panel coming up that is going to delve into many of these potential solutions and uh, give us a really interesting flavor about how uh, both the possibilities as well as uh, you know the considerations and how to think about it. So let me hand over to Susan to take us into the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anu. Um, I am pleased we have a stellar panel uh, to talk about the practicalities of what all of this means. Um, I'm joined today by Mary Meany, who's a senior partner at McKinsey in the Paris office. She's a member of the firm's governing shareholder council, and she's also a co-leader globally of our organization practice. She's a co-author of a book called Leading Organizations, 10 Timeless Truths, and Mary serves a variety of clients on issues related to talent, top um, team performance, and change management. We're also joined by Sir Christopher Pisaridis, who is a Regis professor at the London School of Economics, and he's also a professor at the University of Cyprus. Chris um, was the 2010 recipient of the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics for his work um, on labor market frictions and search costs. Chris is also an academic advisor uh, to the McKinsey Global Institute, and I had the, the pleasure of working with Chris on this report. And finally, we're, we're joined by Stefan Ries, who's a former Chief Human Resources Officer of SAP, um, where he led a company-wide skills transformation. Under his leadership, SAP won numerous awards um, as, a, as a, an employer of choice, both globally and in key local markets. SAP has also been recognized as one of the top HR organizations around the world. And Stefan is currently a senior advisor to McKinsey clients. So, Stefan, I'd like to start with you. You met, you led this major skills transformation while you were at SAP. Um, can you share a little bit about what that looks like on the ground um, and what lessons you learned? Thank you, Susan. I'm, I'm more than happy to do this. And uh, before I'm going to give a little bit of a background of this major skill transformation, um, let me start with one, one personal important finding. I think we all know that the, the current COVID situation is, is a real threat, is a real issue for all of us. But at the same time, I'm a big believer in while you're facing a threat like this, it has always uh, on the other side of the coin the, the opportunity. And so this is how we have approached it with, within SAP. Um, the, the example I want to talk about was a major skill transformation uh, within our services and uh, support business. And Anu shared just a few minutes ago um, a slide where you saw that this has a big impact on, on the transformation and it has been accelerated even by the COVID situation. Now, as I'm a big believer in, you always see light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, let me share with you a little bit um, our experience. So we, we face the fact that the business model in this area uh, of SAP's overall business um, was challenged by the competitive uh, environment. And the market basically told us that you have to change or you rest. And for the next couple of years, you can uh, milk the, the cash cow, so to speak. But then if you just wait and see uh, three to four years later, it will be almost impossible, really impossible to implement uh, a skill transformation. So uh, at that point in time, it, and it was already the year before last and even before the crisis, we took the decision and said, 
we need to change that business. And as the services and support business is heavily man and woman power uh, a business, um, we face the fact that we have to change um, also our skill portfolio within our workforce. So how do you do that? Um, of course, you have to make um, top-down decisions um, in order to set the, 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 the marching order and, and the way going forward. But at the same time, we felt that when you face a transformation with, in our case, more than 25,000 people, you have to make sure that the people are part of the solution. And uh, that was probably the hardest bit, um, because if you're going to tell somebody, that, well, for the last 20 years, thank you very much for your service. You have done an excellent job. But if you want to stay on board, so to speak, you have to change. This is a major challenge. Um, so it's not only something where you have to reach people, people's brain. You also need to touch their hearts. Um, so uh, in our case, um, and with the big help of, of McKinsey at that point in time, we looked into some kind of archetypes of roles we want to change. Um, and those were highly representative of the total workforce we are targeting. And when we looked into those specific roles, we found out that, of course, it takes a lot of investment on our side, but at the same time also an investment on the people's side, on each individual uh, responsibility. And looking back, um, this was really the breakthrough because we were very, very clear right from the beginning that, hey, of course you have the choice. You don't need to reskill yourself, and we're going to help you with this effort. But if you do this uh, over time, it will be very, very hard for you to still get employed either by SAP or by a different uh, organization because your skills unfortunately run out or are replaced by, um, uh, by solutions driven within the digital world. So uh, to cut the long story short, I think um, the biggest issue you can face is if you wait too long. Um, I think you have to tackle it right from the beginning. Um, you have to tell the truth to people. You need to, to make them part of the solution. And last but not least, um, don't, don't look at this as an exercise where it's always the dark black hole. Uh, it has always some, some really positive elements in it. And we were able to turn that business around in 18 months with an unbelievable 3% uh, margin improvement which is in this, in this business really um, something very, very remarkable. So I hope, um, Susan, with this, with this high-level overview, I gave the people a little bit the opportunity to think about it also from the positive side of the house because we, we all know how difficult it is right now uh, in these times. Yeah, that's a great perspective. Thank you. Mary, I want to turn to you next. So, what does reskilling look like when you've got a large frontline workforce? Um, SAP is a professional organization. Um, don't know the actual educational credentials, but it's a more highly skilled workforce. What does this look like uh, for industries um, where you've got a huge number of frontline workers? Yeah, thanks so much, Susan. And and you're right; it does look different if you're educated computer-based uh, workforce versus you know blue collar larger scale uh, workforces and I think what we've seen across this uh, crisis is actually you know some pretty reskilling at a scale that would have been unimaginable before COVID. So I'll, I'll just give an example of Majid al Futaim, which is a very large conglomerate in the Middle East uh, that has a range of different businesses and when the pandemic really hit, they literally reskilled thousands of frontline employees from their cinema businesses as theaters were shutting down into their grocery businesses, which were you know, ramping up. And, and in 48 hours, they literally retrained and redeployed thousands of people. So we're seeing that kind of radical redeployment and reskilling uh, of talent across lots of different occupations across all my clients, whether it's consumer products or pharmaceuticals or energy, 
is upskilling and reskilling managers, right? Because we've all gone through an extraordinarily different period of time. And I think what we're seeing is that actually there are different requirements, right? How do you lead a hybrid or remote team? How do you manage productivity and drive performance when you're re physically remote? You know, how do you create real role clarity in times of tremendous uncertainty? How do you how do you care for the health and well-being of employees, including mental health, which has been a huge issue? Um, so, so all of those skills and skills around resilience and adaptability have been incredibly important, particularly for managers. And then maybe just the last thing is I think there's an increasing recognition, and we highlighted it in the report, but I'm seeing this with many of the clients that I'm working with about the importance of lifelong learning. Um, we, we all know that our technical skills, uh, their shelf life, frankly, is getting shorter and shorter. And so we all have to have curiosity and openness and willingness and ability to learn at all ages and at all levels. Uh, because the world that we live in, the one thing that isn't changing is how much is changing. The one thing that's predictable is how unpredictable it is. And so here, again, what we're seeing is some really interesting experiments to try to engender that lifelong learning for both individuals and, institutional, and institutions uh, to help them succeed and thrive over time. Great, thank you. And I would echo the fact that I, I've now spoken to easily over a thousand companies over the last year, and most management teams are incredibly proud of the way their company responded during COVID and acted much, much faster and more nimbly than they would have thought. So there are many quotes floating around out there about five years of transforma transformation in five months or two, a two-year digital project being implemented in two weeks. Um, and I think that as companies think about how to go forward, now that there is a light at the end of this COVID tunnel, we hope, with vaccines and herd immunity, um, instead of just going back to work the way we did, how do you reimagine and actually retain some of that nimbleness? Chris, let me turn to you. So. It's great that companies are investing in reskilling their workforce, but in the long term, Anu showed us a chart that over the next decade, there will be roles that simply have less labor demand. Um, and many of those are frontline workers in retail, hospitality, and food service. So what role, first of all, do, do public um, organizations or nonprofit organizations play in helping people get into the growing roles. Um, and of course, as an educator, I have to ask you, what role do educators play in this transition? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Susan. I should say it was a very interesting report and it really highlights the important issues that uh, we're going to face over the next 10 years coming out of COVID. And um, and I have you like that. Uh, you asked me the most difficult question of all, I think. <laughs> The, the, the sort of big picture of the transition and, and how do the, the three actors interact. Now, there's no doubt that um, the, the, the initiative and the ones who know what training is needed uh, most are, are, are the companies because they're out in the marketplace. Uh, they're in the arena, as you, as you call them, and, and they can see it happening in front of them. The government and other nonprofit organizations should stand behind and provide support where it's needed. And I'm going to come to that in a minute that, that there is scope for real support. And I was very pleased to hear Stefan say that um, it, it, that training has to be uh, people driven. In, um, in, 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 in economics, at least in the kind of economics that I do, we call it that workers have to own the training, although provided by governments and others. Because if they don't believe that that training will make them better off, they, they're not going to do it, whatever or they might do it just because the company is threatening them but it's going to be in response to the stick not response to the carrot and when it comes to training the carrot is much much more uh, um sort of helpful and uh, increasing productivity now when when it comes to training we have to distinguish first between two uh, classes of people there is the class that um, the, the previous two speakers have been talking about with, who are the employees that are staying with the company or moving to a similar company. And then they're seeing how they can change role within the company and who is going to provide the upskilling and, 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 and the reskilling. And in that case, there is no doubt that uh, the, the company 
uh, has to find a way of uh, making it attractive to the employees to participate and do it because at the end of the day, they, they will both uh, come out better off. Now, government might be needed to step in and provide uh, some help. And, and in fact, this is where the education sector might play a role as well in that uh, the best kind of training might be uh, one or, or two day evenings a week or half days uh, to a university or to a college. And, and, and that has to be provided at high quality by, by government. But government's role is, is more peripheral and supportive. The education system is, is integrated, but it's responding to the needs of, of the company as agreed with the workers, because if there is no agreement, there is, there is no future. Where government, now that, that's the first type of training that we talked about now. But don't forget, you know, those um, occupations that you mentioned just as part of my question, that uh, the question to me that, uh, uh, you know, food services, travel, uh, hospitality, workers will be made unemployed. There is no company to upskill them or, or train them. So what happens to those workers? And there, the government needs to take the big time initiative to uh, help them. And um, in, in a way, we're fortunate that, um, that, that there are good um, case studies in the world, you know, I mean, look at Sweden, Denmark, the other Scandinavia, Germany is applying it uh, successfully, in fact, as well, of the larger countries. Uh, and um, the best policy, I, I think, there, and that's where I am, um, it, it's sort of close to my heart, if you like, because it really, go, it, it really goes to the core of the work that I've been doing for years and years on uh, markets with uh, frictions and search, and when do you take a job, and when uh, do you decline it? And, and it is that uh, let, let first workers do it on their own for a short time, say four months, up to six months, see how they get on. They might find a good match. They might find a company somewhere else in a related occupation, as Anu was saying, that there are changes that would invo involve only small steps uh, within the occupation of the spectrum. And see if they can do it on their own, because that's the best type. If, if, if a worker feels, great, I found this great job, it's a good match with me, and the company has agreed to give me some tra training when I go in. That would be the most successful match. If not, though, at the end of the uh, four to six months, then government has to step in and offer a, a, a training program, a, a, kind of, a, a kind of job guarantee. It, and that, that's the difficult bit, but the Scandinavians have done a very good job in finding those uh, companies. Uh, you, you go into the company, it's heavily subsidized by the government when the company takes on an unemployed worker instead of uh, poaching someone from another company. Um, the training is provided, and um, that's where a combination of uh, school and company training uh, will be even, it, it should be even more prevalent than, uh, than before. And that way we'll manage the transition well and given this enormous task that uh, that we have, it it will be a little bit expensive for the government, more expensive than in normal times. Uh, but at least workers will quickly get back to work, and they will start paying their taxes when they start earning. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, the, you know what? I'm going to crowdsource my role here. There's some really interesting questions coming in. And one of the things I want to do is just try to open this up. I know that WebEx is um, a little bit difficult, but I'd love to try to get some cross conversation among the three of you. So I'm going to put a question out just to all of you. There's a really there are two related questions here. One is about the value of work. Um, it seems like some of the roles that we say will grow, including creatives, a lot of home health care, caregiving roles are growing, but they're not very well paid. So how, how do we think about that? Will that ever change? And then related to that is what about safety nets? Uh, do we, in fact, need to support 100 million people? Um, uh, you know, that need to switch occupations with safety nets. Would love to get all of your perspectives on that. So just unmute yourself and dive in. So maybe just to, to I actually do think that this helps us understand and see and value the importance and dignity of work. 
And, you know, personally, uh, I think there's an enormous amount that we can all learn from the the everyday heroism of frontline healthcare workers, of delivery uh, drivers, of cashiers. We've all seen, I think, a, a tremendous, I mean, this has been an extraordinary experiment. It's not an experiment that we would have chosen. It's certainly not one we designed, but I think we can learn from it. And I do think it calls into question some really fundamental notions about the dignity and value of work. And and I think it's something that we all need to be asking ourselves because, frankly, over this crisis, if it hadn't been for many of these absolutely vital occupations, you know, I, th I think we would have all struggled far, far more than we have. And so I, I do think it's it's an important inflection point and reflection, you know, opportunity for each of us to think about the importance and dignity of work and how do we really value that as a society. That's absolutely right. I, I, I agree entirely with that. The um, it, it, it's quite. I mean, some, sometimes it might sound as, as contradictory, and in, and in fact, I've been criticized in the past when I mentioned things like that. I, I'm a strong believer in a safety net provided by uh, by the government because if people sink into poverty, they become disillusioned, disenfranchised. They just stay home. They sleep in the mornings and watch TV in the afternoon. And we've seen that happen in the United States. In fact, there's something like. 2 million men between the age of, uh, of 25 and 60, 65, I think, that are doing that all the time. You know, my colleague and friend, Angus Deaton, has written a lot about uh, the, them. Um, now, the, the question is, how, that, how is the government prov providing that and uh, not risking work? And given, in fact, what Mary has just said as well, the, the, the best way to provide um, income support and safety net is, is to make sure that there's more job creation in the market. So the best way to do it is to create the conditions for companies to create jobs. And once they do it, then the length of time you remain unemployed is not very long. And during that short of time, support will be easy, more easily provided by the government as the worker self helps herself to, to get the job. Now, the reason I said before when I started speaking that I got into trouble is that I start off by saying safety net is absolutely essential and all, and all that. And people think, ah, you know, here is a, a, a leftist coming to speak to us. And then I say, support companies to create a job. And they say, oh, no, what are you telling us? You know, but, but in fact, that's how it works. It works with the interaction of, of all these things uh, together. You know, if, if through bad luck or whatever else you fail to get a job, then the government should step in and, and help you. But in a way, that provides incentive for you at the same time to go into some kind of training program or, or go and get a job. If you refuse to do that, well, it's bad luck. You know, the, we're not a kind of, uh, how can I describe it? That, that uh, yes, uh, my support is there, come what may. You know? But, but the, I mean, there, it, it's, it, it's not easy to strike the right balance, but there are programs like that that, that will do it. And, and Susan, to build on what, what I can see, um, probably mainly influenced here also by the, the behavior here in Europe or even here in Germany. I have to tell you, I'm I'm disillusioned by the fact that um, it looks like that the government is waiting for the business and the business is waiting for the government, right? Because look at look at jobs in hospitals or elderly care. I mean. It, 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 who else? Who else can can set clear rules um, in terms of the, the value of our work um, than than the government? And I think the society, we all collectively, we have to accept the fact that if somebody works in a hospital environment in, on shifts, I mean, it's and, and then you look at, at ten euro um, hourly paid. This is just crazy, um, and we have to stop that behavior. Um, and I'm a big believer of markets regulate themselves, but in such a case, it, it's going to be almost impossible. Um, and, and, and if hospitals, these guys always running out of money, uh, how, how on earth should they create jobs? Um, they need the support um, and they need maybe the, the moral support from us as a society, but at the same time, I'm a big believer in, in those rules. The government needs to set the tone, um, needs to regulate it. Uh, although I, I don't, I'm not such a big believer in regulation, but I don't, we have, I don't think that we have any chance. Maybe over time, this kind of regulation goes shorter and shorter and shorter, and it's part of our collective DNA um, that we know that 
for example, um, somebody who's working in the hospital and cares about human being, it's worth to pay that uh, maybe 20 euro or 25 euro. But we have to change the pattern. Um, and, and this is unfortunately, in my point of view, not possible if only one party is working on it. I think this needs this kind of uh, collective uh, empowerment through uh, the business as well as the government. And could, could, could I just come in, actually, I mean, my feelings about regulation are exactly what Stefan has said, but where regulation is badly needed is something we haven't talked uh, much about here, either in the summary now, which is the gig economy, because one of the implications of the, uh, of, of the changes, of the structural changes that COVID has, has brought is that gig jobs have grown a lot. You know, these are people who work in, in, in warehouses still there, the delivery people, the drivers, you know, the Uber drivers. And that's why we need regulation, because every job should have some basic um, characteristics, ba basic help to the worker beyond um, the, 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 the pay, be, be beyond the wages. And that's, uh, you know, paid sick leave, paid annual leave, um, a, a, a pension, some kind of security of employment and, and gig jobs, sort of independent contractual jobs, just do not offer that. And that's where because there's no obvious employer to do it. And that's where government needs to step in and provide the regulation and, and find clever ways of supporting them. That's a good, those are great points. I want to bring it back. And again, I'm going to throw this out to all of you. Um, I want to bring this back to uh, the discussion of remote work, because it is one of the big findings of our research that um, although it's a minority of the workforce, we could see three to five times as many people working from home, at least on a part-time basis, uh, than we did before COVID. And again, the pandemic forced a huge experiment, and many companies have found that, that some amount of remote working um, is actually quite productive. People like it because they spend less time commuting um, and so on. So the question is, um, first of all, how are companies thinking about making some kinds of remote work permanent? And then second, what are the implications for what that means for what the office of the future looks like? What happens to cities and downtown areas if people aren't traveling to go to the office space um, as much anymore? We'd love to just throw that out to all of you. Sure, so it, maybe I'll kick it off and I'm sure Chris will, will jump in to talk specifically about cities. And as you said, Susan, this is not everyone, right? The, the remote work is really highly concentrated on highly skilled, highly educated workers, primarily office computer based work. And so, you know, I think Anu talked about 20, 25% of people in advanced economies who can work from home three to five days a week, 10% in emerging economies. Um, so yes, it is a big shift compared to where we've been, but it's still a minority, even if it's you know a significant uh, minority. The second thing I just say is I think a lot of companies are realizing that there are different aspects of your job that can be more or less effectively done remotely. And frankly, there are some things, uh, things that require collaboration, like innovation or brainstorming or really creative problem solving that are actually done better in person. They're more effective in person. They're more fun in person, frankly. Um, relationship building, giving someone really sensitive, difficult feedback, having a courageous conversation, actually being in person, there's something to be said for that. You know, building your culture, your social capital. So I think we're recognizing that even in you, when you can work remotely, there are certain aspects of many jobs that actually benefit from the in-person, the physical contact. Um, so having said all of that, what are we saying? Well, as you said, we're seeing lots of experimentation. Uh, there are a lot of companies that have, you know, very much encouraged uh, employees to continue working remotely for, you know, part of the week, um, you know, more or less of the week, depending on the organization. And of course, there are benefits to employees in terms of flexibility and avoiding commuting time. There are also benefits to the company. And a lot of companies in particular, very expensive real estate costs and very, you know, high cost locations, but also their ESG commitments. Um, so there are a range of reasons why companies are, are looking at this. Um, but I think there are a couple of trends I'll just highlight. The first one is a reduction in office space. Um, so we are absolutely seeing uh, declines in office space, especially in large cities, especially in high cost locations. Um, but even within offices, we're also seeing a reconfiguration 
of what the office space actually looks like. So moving away from desks and private offices towards more open, more team working spaces, more conference rooms with the notion that when you are coming into the office, actually what you wanna do isn't necessarily to go isolate yourself. It's actually purposeful, intentional to come in and interact with others. And then I think, you know, and, and maybe Chris will, will comment on this, but I think we are starting to see some shifts in terms of geographies. Uh, companies shifting out of, you know, real concentrations in the largest cities to suburbs or smaller cities, satellite locations. So I think we're going to see a diversity of, of how companies are, are looking at this opportunity. Um, but, you know, certainly reduction in total office space, especially in the highest cost locations, reconfiguration of what that space looks like. And I suspect some changes on the geographic side, too. Right, right. Stefan. Yeah, I, I, I mean, first of all, Mary, I, I, I'm, I'm totally on your side because I, I do believe um, when I look, for example, in the industry I have worked up to now, it was really those highly educated people within the computer environment. It, it's still a minority, uh, but even there, you face some huge risks because. Think about, for example, um, uh, SAP or any other software company which was growing for the last 12 months. You hired people they have never met as a team. Now, I don't, I don't know how the rest of the participants think about it, but I know that I, when you want to have a high-performing team in place, at a certain point in time, you have to meet. Yeah, it's like in the sports business, right? You have to train together in order to get to, to a peak of high performance. You don't do that through video conferencing only. Um, on the other side, um, I, I see this also like you as an opportunity, like another industrial revolution. Yes, you don't need that kind of office space like in the past. Yes, you need a different office space um, in, uh, when I, when I compare, compare that to single offices or managers have have a room in uh, at the end of the hallway and everybody looks at that person upwards that has totally changed but the the hybrid solution as as arno has pointed it out i i strongly believe this is the future um, especially in in businesses i have worked in uh, because you need both and then when you come to the office there is no need to isolate yourself no need because this is team coll collaboration time uh, but when you're working at home, it is okay to switch off, and, and it is okay to switch off from numbers of meetings and calls. I've met I've met people who said I had today 16 video conferences. I mean, this is insane. Excuse me, 16 video conferences. This is this is not this is not an environment. I would love to see people working who should, for example, be creative and develop something new. This is impossible. And then in between those 60 meetings, uh, your, your two kids are running between your legs and, and then on top, you're also responsible to pick up uh, something at the door. And it's just, this is not the future. Um, so I'm a big believer in a, in a hybrid office environment um, where people, again, what I've said at the beginning of my example, you make them part of the solution. You ask them, how many times do you want to work in the office and, and what's needed also from a collaboration perspective rather than just an order from top down? I think I, I, I was going to take that up actually in the structure of cities, as you were mentioning. The, the, the point is not that one fifth of work, one fifth of companies will, will work remotely and the others will work as before COVID. It is that more and more companies will be using the hybrid model. The, the hybrid model is one that requires you to stay in, in the same big city that you were before. You know, if, if, if you worked in London before and you had five days a week in the office and, and weekends home and no work at home, you, you, you are doing your work. Now, if you have one day a week at home and the other four in the office, you are not going to move out to some cute little village in the Cotswolds or something <laughs> to the West Country and, 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 and commute from there the, the four days in the day there. So if we think of the, of the city now as having hybrid work, 
the, the, the distinction between residential areas and commercial areas breaks down completely. And, and that's going to be the most uh, difficult problem that the um, regulators need to um, uh, change and adapt to and, and to make it functional. Strictly speaking, currently, you are not allowed to work from home. In fact, what we are all doing uh, during COVID, you know, I, I, I work from home. I do all my work from home. Well, in fact, my the contract when I bought my home, it says this is a residential area. You are not allowed to work from home, you know, for, for, for income. That maybe they're making an exception now because of COVID, but it, it cannot just stay like that. It needs to change. So economic geographers and uh, lawyers, in fact, will have a, a very big job in re restructuring the city that the distinction is not there. Now, now, how do you do it? Well, you do it when I go to my uh, to, to my university, to the LSE, and, and I need a break. I walk for five minutes out of my office and I need at least six or seven, uh, f five minutes in any direction. You're going to meet a cafe very soon. And about six or seven different ones. Five of those are Starbucks. The other two are the cute Italian ones. <laughs> the, 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 the sort of more niche ones. I, I walk out of my home and the, the best I can do is a break on a five minute walk is if I'm lucky, I'm going to get to the park, which is completely empty of any facilities. So where are you going to meet the people and all that? that, that that's what is going to change and how they design it would be very important. Now, now there's so. I mean, it was very. I was very interested this morning to read in, um, in, in the Economist. In fact, the, the, the magazine they were reporting a new survey that the results came out yesterday, which is a, which is exactly what Stefan was saying that that um, it's a survey of how, how many hours people work during um, the, the pandemic, and on, on average, uh, professional people that use the computer at home to work, they work two hours a week longer. Than normal, and they complained that all those two hours went on um, meetings that were completely unnecessary, answering messages that were unnecessary, and um, the, um, the, the 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 company that did the survey was sort of speculating whether it was really managers worrying is it a way of monitoring, you know, like like when you're suspecting your partner, you keep calling at home all the time on the home phone, not on the mobile thing to see. Hello, I thought I missed you. I thought I talked to you kind of thing. Whether it's like that, or, um, or or if it's a case of the employee doing the same, calling into the office to show that they are not playing games on their uh, laptop yeah. at any time, or just creating meetings because Zoom is there in a way, you know, like the WebEx is good too, I should say. <laughs> so uh, we, we don't know, but obviously this cannot continue. We cannot introduce remote work because it increases efficiency and at the same time introduce all these new ways of communicating and not being able to focus over long periods. You know exactly what uh, Stefan was saying that we need to change. So very interesting uh, the times ahead for economic geographers. Yes, well, I want to thank you all. Peter, I know that we're we've left a very little time. We have other interesting questions, but um, if you would like to field some of the questions that have come in, um, that would be fantastic. Thank you, Susan. Yes, indeed. Um, we've had a lot of really interesting questions coming in. Thank you very much. We haven't got enough time to go through them all, uh, but there is a, a number of questions around the report itself um, and the findings, um, in particular around geography, how big are the differences between the countries and also within countries, how big are the differences between urban areas and rural areas? And finally, uh, another distinction between large companies and small and medium sized companies. Perhaps the authors could address those quickly. Anu's on mute. So maybe I'll kick off. So one of the things we see between countries, there are big differences, of course, and it depends on what industries and occupations you start with in the country. Um, and also what the level of income is. So we found in India, for instance, despite COVID having a really big impact of the last year, when you look at the long term in India, nearly every type of job is growing. And that's simply because India is projected, its economy is projected to grow. As Chris was saying, it's creating demand for all types of occupations. Um, and just the structural shift out of agriculture into manufacturing and services is the dominant long term trend. Um, 
Whereas when you look at, say, the UK or the US that have a large number of computer-based service jobs, there's more remote work potential. Um, when you look at, at Germany, it's got a very strong manufacturing base uh, that continues to be automated. Um, and so that's a predominant trend there. So um, when you look at our report, we, we do offer snapshots of all eight countries and they're quite different. Um, we have not drilled down really to the subnational level, though. For those of you who are familiar with our work, um, we did future of work in Europe and future of work in America, where we drilled down to a very granular local level. Uh, we haven't done that yet, but stay tuned later in 2021 for those results. So thank you very much, Susan. There's one. Um... Uh, other cluster of questions that's been coming in around skills, um, and they, the questions are really around what sort of skills, how to prioritize them. Should they be around soft skills being learned or about technical skills? And also the higher educate, the role of higher education in, in actually giving those skills to a new generation. Uh, perhaps Chris and Mary, you might want to uh, address those. Should I start, Mary, or shall I? Why don't you Why don't you kick us off, Chris, and then I'll jump in. <laughs> okay. Well, this 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 question is a really 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 big one, actually, both for um, uh, educationists and governments and, and companies, because the the answer is that they are both badly needed, and you shouldn't be prioritizing. You should be doing it simultaneously. Different people will have. Uh, different comparative advantages in each type of skill and they should learn it. But the future of work will require them both. It will require the STEM skills uh, for those who work with the new equipment with the uh, in, in, in the companies that are automating. Um, the, the managers, if you like, should understand STEM and, and of course the researchers, those doing the R&D, you know, those working with the robots. Now, the, those are much bigger numbers than um, we've had in the past, but they will not be the, they will not be the majority of jobs because, uh, because of automation, basically. The majority of jobs will be in sectors that cannot be automated. And before COVID, we all happily said, uh, all you need there, there is social skills, there are sectors that have human interaction, you know, think mental illness, uh, hospitality, providing good service in a restaurant, travel, you don't want a robot to come and serve you your food and tell you, about the wonderful things they put in there to, to give you, you know. Now with COVID, this is changing, but I think we're going to go back eventually to one where it's providing the, providing the service. Now, universities, of course, have to adapt, and especially schools. I mean, I'm, I'm a great believer of beginning these things from preschool, you know, from age three, mm -hmm. just doing it in the form of, of games. You know, the environment, you have to teach children how to respect it because environment and sustainability are going to be important. But social skills, you know, don't leave it all to the parents teach the school as well the importance. Learn them to enjoy maths and uh, basic science, you know, do, the, do these wonderful experiments with, uh, to, to show them. And, and, and then you move up and up in doing it and, and, and make sure the basic, the social skills, uh, emotional skills are, are composite, are, get composite in the market as well as the uh, technical skills. Otherwise, you won't get good people going into them and we do need good quality as well in that sector of the market. Yep, yep. so yep. completely agree with Chris. Um, you need both, it needs to start early. The one thing I would just add is it needs to continue for the entire, for your entire life, right? So that notion of lifelong learning and that's something that we really need to help to learn how to learn and to have the curiosity, the openness, the humility, and the courage to keep learning throughout their entire lives. So that's the one big thing I would add. Great. Well, thank, thank you very much indeed, uh, all of you, for a fantastically interesting discussion. And uh, you can read more about the future of work uh, in our report, and the URL is just flashing up on the screen in a sec. Thank you very much for joining this MGI Economics Insight webinar. Um, as we said earlier on, there will be two further reports in this series that will be coming out later this month, one on recovery and consumer demand, and the other one which is about the potential for a broad recovery based on productivity and innovation. And MGI will be hosting virtual events for both of those. So thanks for joining us and have a great afternoon.